Um, I appreciate your patience while we uh, plod through a lot of uh, very uh, technical material. Um, I have um, many additional features for things that I'd like to cover today, but there's one topic which has been sitting in the background um, in a way that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And uh, I was hoping to address it uh, with some remarks here. <clears throat> it's a set of remarks that are somewhat ad hoc in nature, but which I hope to, um, where I hope to communicate a few basic truths and, and to uh, place in, put in place an edifice on which to build in, in thinking. Um, I would remind you that uh, on the first day of this boot camp, um, I highlighted system science as a tradition. A tradition where, which focuses on the many systems in the world. And certainly, the, the vast majority of systems that give us trouble in the world um, that are distinguished by the fact that they're complex. Uh, complex not merely in a casual sense, but in the sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. They, they exhibit non-linearity, non and, and, and by virtue of that, they exhibit surprising behavior. And one of the most um, beyond sort of uh, curious or puzzling behavior that's of merely intellectual curiosity, the, one of the big implications of surprising behavior is they react surprisingly to our attempts to understand and, and manage them. And uh, most human systems exhibit this feature. Many socio-technical systems involving combinations of technology and, and human behavior also exhibit these features of complexity. These systems are gnarly to deal with because they are entangled in, in ways that prevent us from just taking them apart into their pieces, understanding those, and having clarity about how to best understand or manage the system as a whole. And on that first day, when I talked about system science techniques, I gave an overview of two system science techniques of note. One of them was system dynamics modeling. Indeed, within the past day, we've seen our share of system dynamics models coupled with particle filtering models. And we've argued on the basis of many of those models that this is a profoundly, this is an area of profound promise. One that can lead to a certain unity of, of, of data science needs and system science needs. The need for data science to understand the underlying processes, to be able to anticipate future trends by capturing the underlying mechanisms. And the need, on the other hand, for, for system science to be able to inform our increasingly articulated models with rich understanding garnered from many, many data sets, some of them live coming in. And I think we've, we've, we've done that well. And the students have done me proud in terms of their demonstrations of the promise here. But when I spoke with you on Monday, and indeed, even in the first example I showed you, the system science model, that system science model was not, in fact, the system dynamics model. Actually, it did contain some elements of system dynamics models. It had, had weight change adjusting according to stocks and flows. But much of it was an agent-based model in, in design. The model I showed a bit later um, that afternoon, or it was Tuesday afternoon, I think, which was outputting synthetic data sets related to opioids. Whilst that did have, again, a, 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 a system dynamics component related to, um, uh, related to the processes of tolerance build up within a person and, and uh, processes associated with uh, opioid dependence, it was 
predominantly an agent-based model. We had agents circulating in space. They were surrounded by networks of individuals. They had connections to dealers and connections to others in, the, in their family. Um, their behaviors were, were characterized in the context of a geographic space. Each of those agents had properties and evolving state as articulated in state charts beyond the system dynamics component. And you may have noticed that within the many exciting examples we've shown of models informed by particle filtering, we have not yet included an agent-based model. And I'd like to talk about this. I'd like to talk about about this. First, I want to remind you, agent-based models feature one or more populations, um, you know, agents, with parameters, with state, with actions and rules for under which those actions are undertaken. They have ways of interacting. Thanks a ton, Alex. I'm sorry for the trouble. That's awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a time horizon over, over which they run. And, you know, with aggregate models, we, we capture heterogeneity to a degree, to a limit. We capture, we chunk people up into groups, age group 0 to 4, 5 through 9, 10 to 14, for example, um, or according to their sex. Um, and by so doing, we, we can capture some amount of heterogeneity. We subdivide them according to their characteristics. In fact, we organize them according to their state and characteristics. So people are divided up here according to their underlying state, whether they're susceptible, whether they're exposed, infected, or recovered. They're put into different bins, and we count the number of people in each of those bins. So we organize it according to state and their characteristics. If, if we need male and female as Rifat's model had, we'll have a male level and we'll have a female level, sort of a stratification of the model, and those will run in parallel. So we organize it according to their state and characteristic, and each stock keeps track of the data, and the data here is just the count of individuals in that stock. By contrast, in agent-based modeling, we are organizing the model not by people's state and characteristics, but rather we organize it according to individuals, and each individual keeps track of their state and characteristics. Each of those individuals can be put in networks, can be placed at a certain point in space and so on. So the data here kept track of um, in the organization is their, their current state, their evolving state, and their their characteristics. And this allows us to capture nested hierarchies. The fact that a child may be in a school, um, which may itself be nested in a neighborhood. Um, the child may be in multiple networks, etc. As you recall, we have we define agents, so we place them in a population. We give those agents parameters, and all the people in our population have specific values of those parameters. Remember this? hearing no objections. Um, uh, we, we say that the agent is associated with a certain state such that every instance of that agent is, 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 is provided with being in some particular states at a given time. And um, aspects of state may include everything from aging to stress levels to capacity to self-regulate to level of toxic stress being um, currently being experienced, their accumulated allostatic load, etc. Coping mechanisms that they've learned. And we might, with a given agent, have more than one type of, of state we keep track of. So we, we might have state charts, each of which deals with a specific set of concerns. Hmm? Specific kind of set of concerns. Um, and they have ways of interacting like like networks or we place them in geography, and we look at the patterns so induced. This for, uh, induced by an early model of chronic wasting disease, with which Paul 
has at least a glancing acquaintance and and has replaced with a more uh, with uh, with a model responsive to more recent needs and capabilities and this can provide us with a great deal of insights we not only see the patterns over time writ large in the presentations of Anahita and of uh, Xiaoyan with respect to measles and, and, and chickenpox and pertussis and and uh, influenza, the patterns over time, which um, are elicited from data sources online, but we can also recognize patterns over space. Patterns that build up in geography or in some sort of um, alternative spatial context. Um, models like this, agent-based models, have stochastics by which they evolve. With a system dynamics model we saw that we used in particle filtering, we actually added some stochastics. We added stochastics associated with uh, contact, evolving contact rate or fraction reported or the number of people getting incidents. But stochastics are pretty built in to agent-based models, reflecting the fact that behavior at an individual level, say of a person, is pretty stochastic. It's not completely stochastic. There's big regularities. But the vagaries of exactly when I'm going to take my next sip of tea have a fair degree of variability. Or the vagaries as to perhaps uh, when a couple will get in an argument that would threaten domestic violence um, uh, might be associated with stochastics. And in that sense, these models might seem to be a very good fit to our needs in agent-based modeling where there needs to be a certain requisite uh, variety. We can also, within ABMs, capture different levels of scale and context, of nesting of different contexts, much as in, uh, as in models uh, uh, that, that are incorporate um, both random and fixed effects or in hierarchical linear modeling, statistically, we may analyze data from a hierarchy of different contexts. So it is with these models that we can capture these contexts, but here we're generating data from the bottom up in terms of the behavior at the individual level, which may interact with the contextual level and lead to patterns aggregated up at each of these different levels. So we might have cities or, or schools collect, or that are collections of individuals and those schools, for example, serve as microenvironments for spread of infection or attitudes or norms, et cetera. Agent-based models have profound strength to them and the strength is not entirely obvious when you first encounter them. Um, but they capture rich heterogeneity they can capture continuous quantities that are otherwise approximated in a discrete way in a system dynamics model that's aggregate in character. For example, we could lend each person a continuous age that is based on their, age, their, their birthday and the age over time. We could lend them a continuous weight or height. We can, we can capture aspects of heterogeneity in a very rich way both continuous and, and discretized or, or um, for example, categorical in nature. We can have interventions that are targeted at individuals with a certain characteristic, young men who, who are in a certain region and have certain, um, uh, circulated in certain social circles, perhaps this issue with gangs. We could imagine having interventions focused on that. We can represent in short network context, spatial context, multi-level um, nesting. We can capture situated decision making in these models. The fact that an agent in a certain social context may engage in risky behavior, say with other young men of, of similar age, where, whereas that agent in another context might behave in a, in a less risky way. Um, we can capture the fact that decision making is situated in the sense of being based on localized perception. I only am viewing things from my little neck of the woods and I'm making decisions based on my knowledge there and I don't realize you know, the opportunities available elsewhere. Critically with these models, agent-based models, 
in contrast to aggregate sort of models we've been dealing with, we have the capacity to reason about, to collect, and reflect on, and indeed take into account in decision making in the model, longitudinal information on an agent's trajectory. What is given in those, in those models that have been shown to you, the models say of measles or chickenpox, of H1N1 influenza or pertussis, is very powerful indeed. But it provides a cross-sectional depiction of the population over time. We count how many people at one time say are infected with measles, how many people are at one time infected with gonorrhea. But we don't keep track of how many people have gotten gonorrhea more than one time, or two times, how many people have a long history of it. We're not able to really express that without, uh, without really sort of uh, adapting the whole model structure around the need to do that. We cannot flexibly accumulate information on people's biographies, where they came from, that this is an individual who's developed gestational diabetes and indeed type 2 diabetes in life, and we, can, we can't easily go back and say what was their birth weight. Because in order to do that, we'd have to divide up the population to remember their birth weight, just like we divide it up by sex or age. We'd have to divide it up by what their birth weight was and could only do so in very crude categories. With an age-based model, it's a simple matter to have the model keep track of my formative life experiences and have it tag it with that with the agent to remember, say, when my birth date was so that, not so I could have a celebration of it, but so that I could uh, consider it in, in, um, in terms of uh, my later behavior. We can also target individuals with certain backgrounds, certain behaviors, um, perhaps antisocial behaviors, perhaps behaviors of past incarceration, uh, behaviors associated with past uh, care seeking, um, or lack thereof, and we can target an intervention, we can calibrate to it. Young Chen, in her models of, uh, of uh, gestational diabetes in the Australian Capital Territory, um, calibrates to, histor to data involving a person's history. Um, so the fact that they were born to a mother who had this, this level, of this glycemic situation, with diet, but full type 2 diabetes, gestational diabetes, or, or um, was normal glycemic. And given that they themselves, the child, was born with a certain weight, what they're likely at developing diabetes is. And she can calibrate to that. She can calibrate the model to the history of individuals in a way we can't with an aggregate model. Because people in an aggregate model are but numbers. Within an, within an age-based model, we have precise endogenous characterization uh, that we can capture on sort of implementation science issues, intervention, uh, intervention effects in a, in a rich way. And for some stakeholders, the visualization at an age-based level can be very powerful. I argued earlier that we can output data from these agent-based models in a way that can be then used to evaluate system science or data science methods, uh, machine learning methods, etc. These two approaches are each very powerful. These two approaches, when it comes to supporting data science, I believe each has unique advantages. But I don't want to disadvantage agent based models uh, by skewing. On the, on the side of only featuring, only featuring system dynamics models in our repertoire of, of insights from, um, uh, from particle filtering. There's many benefits to each, but we need to give agent-based models uh, their due, and indeed individual-based models. Now, I'm going to start using some terminology that I introduced in a somewhat controversial paper in, um, I think it was around 2006, 2007, I delivered a paper at the System Dynamics Conference that argued, that, that took a stand, uh, took a perspective when it, when it came to the role of agent-based models and system dynamics models. And I argued in this paper that the, salient, the most salient distinction 
was not between system dynamics and ancient base, but between whether a model is aggregate in character or individual base. That's a different distinction. People often oft conflate them. They think that a system dynamics model is by nature aggregate, and an ancient based model is by nature uh, individual based. I would argue that that's not true. There is a rich room for individual level models that are articulated using system dynamics. And indeed, those form the heart of many hybrid models that we built. And in fact, those two models that I had you peruse on that very first day, the model on the one hand involving uh, food environment and physical activity, and on the other, a model involving opioid abuse. Those are both hybrid models. They use system dynamics for characterization of individual level factors, and on the one hand, weight related, and the other hand, tolerance buildup and, and craving related. And I would argue that it's really a matter of if we articulate things at an individual level model, we get great gains when it comes to data science. Um, models articulate at an individual level can both use information related to individual pathways and inform understanding at the level uh, of, of, of pathways. I'm going to show an example of this. I don't think I include it uh, here, unfortunately. But I'll have another example where I show this, how both data science in the form of big data can illuminate pathways, mechanisms, these generative pathways we speak about in critical realism, um, these causal pathways, as they're sometimes termed, that lead to effect. Data science can inform that through big data, and these sort of individual-based models can depict it. Um, with big data, we can capture individual level variety and heterogeneity. Um, I've argued we could use models as a synthetic data source previously. Um, but it turns out we can also inform study design with these models um, uh, through, through synthetic data. We can incorporate networks, geography, and space, which are informed by the types of data collection, and try to match patterns. We can capture preference and choice behavior and people's aspects of people's history and longitudinal evolution. One of the most powerful things we get out of a tool like Ethica is the capacity to capture data at an individual level over time. Okay, um, And uh, we can relate this to our models in a way we can't with an aggregate model. Um, we can incorporate individual level longitudinal information and parameters that govern it. We can incorporate data regarding agent uh, biography and history, um, geographic context, preferences, localized perception, um, aspects of memory. By contrast, in an aggregate model view, we're really providing a cross-sectional view that doesn't distinguish individuals where we can't track individual histories and where we can't really relate them to the type of longitudinal data we get out on an individual um, from things like uh, smartphones or wearables, et cetera. Okay? There's a lack of resolution at an individual level. Now, I want to deal squarely with this um, issue of performing particle filtering and indeed this technique that I'm coming to, a particle MCMC, with individual base models. There's several different levels at which I could adjust this. One is for agent-based models, okay? Um, with agent-based models, we have, within the model, a large amount of state that is stored. Um, within each agent, that agent may be in many states. Here, we see an agent with respect to different concerns can each, with respect to each of those concerns, they can be in many states. And what this means is if they can be in, say, two states with respect to this one, three with respect to that one, 
They can be in any combination of those um, in many cases, which would mean six possible states. We start multiplying this, say, by another four states, going to 24 possible states each individual could be in. Multiplied by another four yet, get up to 96 states that each individual could be in, and so on. And if each individual can be in n states, and we have two individuals, they can be in n squared. Any combination of them, three n cubed, in successively larger, uh, larger numbers. So what it comes down to is, at the level of an individual, it can be in a very large number of possible states. And once it comes to a population, if you're reasoning about the possible number of states the whole population could be in, it grows geometrically with the number of agents. Meaning, if we have, if we have p saw a population of size p. Each of the agents can be at n possible states. In principle, we can have n to the p different states. The whole population could be in, because each individual could be in each of the n. Two individuals, it's n times n, or three, it's n times n times n, and just extend it out to n times itself p times, or n to the p. It's a very large number of states. It's a very large state space, okay? Um, it's expansive. And with aggregate data only, it is not, in my view, not feasible. And this remains to be scientifically fully assessed. I would argue, in fact, I'm overly, I'm, I'm, I'm overly dramatizing the situation. Because in theory, our work has suggested that even though in theory it's n to the p size of the state space, if we have these discrete states, the fact is people only occupy a very thin sliver of that. The behaviors within an individuals are within an individual are fairly well defined. There's there's not any activity that's engaged in any place. When I come here, I give a lecture, and perhaps I you know, drink some tea and, and consume some food. I don't engage in my morning run in this room, uh, nor that I sleep in this room. Each of, my, each of my behaviors is defined with respect to certain places. I'm not exhibiting all possible behaviors. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. Um, I don't know, maybe you would. Uh, um, but the point is that actually human behaviors are tightly constrained by norms. They're tightly constrained by um, uh, societal uh, societal constraints um, uh, and in physical limitations, and so the truth is, in an age-based model, it exhibits a lot of low-dimensional dynamics. It exhibits much much more confined behaviors than you would think. But in principle, we have a very expansive state space, and it remains to be fully elucidated about whether an, uh, a particle filtering model can fully explore that space. This is one of the areas where Cheyenne may yet contribute. It may be her destiny to help answer this question. Um, but, but that's for her to decide. Um, the, the fact is, with, with agent-based models compared to aggregate models, we have a much larger number of possible states that they can be in theoretically. And probably even at a practical level, they can be much more varied. We can have one agent being, you know, uh, in an anti-social uh, state, and another one being in a pro-social uh, state. One being one having very positive youth development, and the other uh, being truant, uh, or vice versa. And so you get lots of different possibilities that are possible when you pick things in an agent-based model that may not be fully feasible to explore with a traditional particle filter with a feasible number of particles. The larger the number of states in a stock and flow model and a system dynamics model, the larger the number of particles. Some of the models that, that with which Xiaoyan was working, the, the model that jointly links chicken pox and measles had 20,000 particles. Is that right? Yeah, and an agent-based model of that may need more yet. It may or may not be feasible to explore that, but it's at the level of our 
of, of research at this point. But I want to highlight a key proviso on my statement. I did not say it's uncertain whether particle filtering can be effectively used with agent-based models or with individual-based models. What I said is particle filtering, when used with an agent-based model um, uh, and only aggregate data, may have to take a very large <coughs> number of particles that may be at least one. If you have individual level data, even data that pins down a few individuals um, over time, you may be able to really constrain the interpretation, constrain the set of possible hypotheses in a sense, in a, in a way that they could be explored. Um, individual level data can tie down the dimensionality of the feasible state space and allow favoring particles to focus on those areas of state space, okay? And individual level longitudinal data might, might be effectively, um, be particularly powerful in tying down, um, uh, tying down uh, an individual level model in terms of its interpretation of the situation, um, in terms of pinning down estimates for parameters. So when it comes to agent-based models in particle filtering. Have we done it? We have. Our investigations suggest that with aggregate data alone and a modest number of particles, it does not yield big insights. If we had thrown more particles at it, could we have gotten better results? Maybe. That is yet to be elucidated. If we had individual level data, could we have gotten better better uh, results, I would put my money on yes, for sure. So what this suggests is, when we're doing particle filter with an agent-based model, it is advised to join it with, with data that is, that is at a corresponding fine level of granularity. Okay? If you're gonna build an agent-based model and you wanna use particle filtering, you'd be advised combine it with individual level data, at least some individual level data, to constrain the hypotheses about what's going on. Because otherwise you're, blue, you're viewing almost a box from the outside, you're just seeing aggregate results and trying to figure out who's doing what inside for those different agents is very difficult. But if you have data on what's going on at the agent level, that really ties down your hypotheses a lot more as to what's going on. And where can we get data at an aggregate level? Wearables, smartphones, traces from the level of an individual, but not merely that. Case reports, reports from, from data of contact with social workers, um, records from episodes of care that an individual is engaged in within a health institution. Um, records associated with, with uh, their contact with the educational system. Um, we can get data at the level of individuals quite readily in a way that can, can tie down our interpretation. And I think to really apply particle filtering effectively to a multi-agent model, a, a model with multiple agents, you need that sort of data at an individual level model at an individual level. Now, I will know that there's another thing we can do too. And we've done quite a bit of this. And it's very valuable. And it's to build models <clears throat> that are articulated at a level of an individual. So, there's a number of models out there within the, the literature. Bryce is working with one right now on, on physical activity and weight change, for example. Um, we can actually describe an individual, for example, using a set of system dynamics equations. We can characterize their physiology in a change over time, this particular example, weight change. We might characterize aspects of their ideation and mental state. Maybe it's not just a system dynamics model that we use. Maybe we use also the language of state charts. But the point is if we focus at the level of an individual 
and we have individual level data to inform that, and we do particle filtering on hypotheses for what's going on within an individual. Now that is right territory. And that's what I was speaking with uh, about earlier with models of pathology as well. If you have data at that level and you're using it to peer into a particular case, what might be going on? Hypothesize what might be going on within that child under protection's mind or within this individual who's um, at risk of suicidal ideation. There's a lot of promise there. I would note that those models may be system dynamics models, but this gets back to the heart of my point from 2006 to 2007. The issue is not system dynamics versus agent-based modeling, as much as partisans wanted it to be then and some still want it to be now. The issue is, is the model articulated at an individual level? If it is, it, it opens it up to certain types of, of, of inquiry involving longitudinal evolution, understanding of certain aspects of heterogeneity and context that, that uh, are, are richer. And here, with a system dynamics model and an individual-based model, or a hybrid model and an individual-based model, we can perform particle filtering just as we had with the model shown by Xiaoyan and by, by uh, Anahita and by Rifat and by others. We can take these methods for particle filtering and undertake particle filtering on a model of a person which hypothesizes as to their pathophysiology or their underlying mental state or their underlying um, degree of distress and use it to gain insight about, um, about what's going on internally based on imperfect data. Within that sphere, a hidden Markov model is just not up to snuff and characterizing the, the, the complexities of some of those transitions. And we can use a system dynamics or aggregate model to engage in those sorts of behaviors. And if it's a system dynamics model, they can use Xiaoyan's uh, framework or the framework that uh, I have shared uh, online that, that forms a, um, uh, a basic platform for a reusable platform for agent-based or for, for particle filtering. So these individual level characterizations as system dynamics models um, are very valuable. Um, I would note that they can be incorporated in agent-based models with many other agents as well. Um, and they, in principle, could be outfitted to stream the sort of data that Lucia saw, um, although only in a very secure environment, as pointed out by the app. Now, Models like this, I believe, can be of great promise. There's many published models in the literature that are starting to get into issues, for example, such as the, the underlying dynamics, as depicted in a system dynamics model, of depression, or, or uh, HPA axis and responses to stress uh, along the sympathetic uh, nervous system or autonomic nervous system activity in other areas, such as parasympathetic response, and, and trying to incorporate um, the uh, polyvagal theory uh, that, that has achieved some, uh, some degree of, of interest coming from Porges. So um, these models increasingly seek to take on an understanding not only of physiology at a biomedical level, but of psychology and, and the, 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 the combination of those two, um, the, embodied, the embodied mind. So there's a great deal of promise here in using these methods with, to shed light on issues at an individual level with individual-based models making use of, say, system dynamics techniques using the particle filtering approaches uh, just seen. Agent-based models, can then be built which incorporate those as modules. The challenge um, with ABMs that, that we have to address is high dimensionality, state space, I mentioned it earlier, the need for, therefore, for individual level data to inform it, to constrain our interpretations, computing power needed, um, um, 
Stochastics. Uh, stochastics are a good map for PMCMC and particle filtering, but not so much for MCMC. Um, memory consumption. Agent-based models require a lot of memory. Um, so if we have if we have thousands of particles, each of which has a full copy of an agent-based model, remember each particle has to have a full set of model state, and for an agent-based model that includes the full state of the model, which may be very large, the memory consumption can be correspondingly large. Um, there's, uh, when you're employing techniques to speed up the model using parallelization, say with GPUs, there's concerns about the nature of the code to which it's kind of everything executing the same code at the same time or which it's very conditional and branching. I won't get into that, but it's a technical thing that Lugia would interpret, uh, would be able to, um, to understand. And uh, another, another challenge is right now, at the current time, it's much easier to articulate, to create a particle filtered model with a system dynamics model than it is for an agent based model. There is no current extant agent-based modeling framework, not repast, not any logic, not swarm, et cetera, that supports the ability to create particle filters with agent-based models. And what that means is you've got to roll your own. And uh, that means writing your own little agent-based modeling framework so it can operate within each particle. It ain't pleasant. It ain't pleasant. We're involved in some innovation that I'm hoping will make particle filtering of the model as, as painless as flipping a switch. But um, that remains uh, that remains some years in the future, and some students in the future. Um, <laughs> perhaps. Well, if 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 Shaoyan wants, uh, she could. She could, yeah, she could achieve that. Um, great, great future for that young woman. Um, so, um, so, ladies and gentlemen, right now, the state is such that we can quite readily engage in particle filtering of system dynamics models. We can use system dynamics models at the level of an individual or at the level of the population. We know how to particle filter in them well. We can do so with a modest amount of mechanism. Um, we, can, we, have, we have templates that I've created for my students, and my students have further evolved, which can be used to duplicate, um, you know, to, to, to start out on creating a model and uh, allows you to focus your energies um, on, on a smaller set of things in the model instead of having to reinvent the wheel. You, you can reuse a lot of things from earlier models. But at the same time, agent-based models are a, uh, which have multiple agents uh, are a, a trickier ball of wax. There's research questions there and there's engineering questions. How to build, how to build them easily, but also what the degree to which we can use aggregate data to pin them down or whether we need individual level data. We will continue to push on this issue when I offer this boot camp next year. I hope to have a clearer answer in, in how many particles are needed for an agent-based model to inform it only with aggregate level data. But in the meantime, we will be pushing forward with, with some of those models um, for exploration, if possible, with individual level data, which I am confident will be a fruitful enterprise. So that's a little bit about agent-based models, system dynamics models, why you saw so many system dynamics models presented but a paucity of agent-based models. It's not that there's great need or, or, or not great promise, there is. It's just we have, we have ways to go to fully support the needs of, of uh, agent-based modeling and I believe somewhat different data sources are need to inform them. So that was a long monologue. Any, any questions related to that? It's an important point. Yes, Terry. Yes. Yep. Yep. You could have multiple individuals. Um, yes, you could. Um, and actually, that's not that hard to do if you're talking a small number of individuals. 
Now, if you're talking about a population of individuals, um, you, you can, in principle, do that. Um, it's, it's a, uh, it, 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 is, it is possible, um, and it's not a crazy idea at all. Um, it's just that you're going to be, it's going to get inflexible as you want to simulate um, uh, open populations with people coming in and people leaving or what have you. Uh, it, it, it becomes hard to, to do it effectively. Um, with that, without a lot of awkwardness, but it's readily possible. And I've actually done a lot of modeling like that, where we have system dynamics characterizing the behavior of multiple individuals um, simultaneously. Um, in fact, that's very similar to a model Price has been been working with um, uh, originally. And uh, you know, there's some trade-offs with it, but in this situation, it's it's not a bad prospect. I would just not do it with like. Like you wouldn't want to do it with a model with, you know, a million people in it or something like that. Um, but if you wanted to simulate like maybe a small gang or something like that and their interactions of a group of, you know, of 10 or 15, it's not a crazy idea. And in fact, it's a little known fact, um, but uh, some of the earliest system dynamics models contributed in the late 50s, early 60s, certainly by the early 60s, I believe the late 50s, were of uh, inter-firm com uh, competition among different companies. And they were basically in individual companies simulated as system dynamics models. Um, but within the same model, you'd have multiple companies competing. And, and it's very, it may not seem obvious, but it's, it's basically the same idea. You have multiple individual things, actors, agents, as it were, whose, whose behavior is described with uh, with system dynamics and they're connected together. Could you do part of filtering on that? Yes, you could. And you would probably just want to couple it with some data at the level of an individual. Like, like it, it, I would not advise doing it if all you have is, is aggregate data. Um, because it, it's hard. It's, it's hard using aggregate data to infer what's going on at the individual level, as I think you appreciate. Yeah. Does that make sense? But but for a small number of individuals, yeah, I'd say it would be very practical, actually. Yeah. And not much harder than what Shayan has done with, she subscripted it by particle. What you basically do is subscript it by person. Bryce is familiar with this. And what Shayan has done is subscripted the model by particle and age group, for example. Uh, and this would be by particle and person. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be quite quite nice. I can see it in my head. Yeah. It's it's a safe it's a safe, safe bet. Yeah, yeah. Other questions? Did I, did I answer that though? Okay. Okay. Other questions? Ladies and gentlemen, we are at here a moment in time where I argued at the beginning of this boot camp that uh, the number of people applying system science and data science is almost a set of measure of zero. It's, 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 it's almost, it's, it's a very, very, very small sliver of the community. The tools are not there yet to do it really, really well. We are trying to contribute them. The, the Lujade's tool um, contributed this morning is an early, early contribution. The particle filtering framework we built up is an early contribution. Um, a tool you'll see in the Oculus brought to this very hotel uh, for Andrew's delight um, <laughs> uh, is, is part of that toolbox. We're building up tools, but um, you know we're only slowly building the community that will help help us in building them and so on and uh, and so it's it's slow work and we have to recognize that certain things are easier now certain things that we can conceptualize quite clearly what's needed there just hasn't yet been a chance to build the tool I, I need the right student to build it who has that interest in in programming languages and and. Uh, and uh, compilers and uh, 
and uh, capturing the semantics crisply within a model um, um, in, in a way that would allow it to be part of the culture. Okay. Um, so, any other any other questions? I've seen a lot. Okay. Um, so, this is probably pretty heavy stuff. Um, I'm I'm reading the room, and I'm going to propose doing some Ethica stuff. <laughs> doing some hands-on stuff. What do you think? Who wants? To, well, let me think about. Who wants to do, who wants to hear about um, uh, the first step towards particle MCMC is for us to discuss MCMC, which is, is a technique for sampling, for estimating parameter values. How many people would enjoy learning more about the Ethica system with a couple simple uh, steps in Ethica? <laughs> Okay, a couple. How many people would like to hear about MCMC? Okay, okay, okay. Well, I guess the eyes have it. Okay, um, I'll be happy to oblige. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I will stop this recording. For those who haven't been following,